We are live. JT here. Welcome to The Huddle. The Huddle is where I sit down with successful people from the world of sport and coaching. It's to learn more about their journey to greatness. Why do I have these conversations? Because success always leaves clues. I want to welcome you. Whether you are watching live as we stream into our Facebook community, whether you are watching the replay in Facebook or on YouTube, whether you are listening to the recording on the podcast, thank you so much for being here with me and my special guest today. And what I want to do is I want to remind you that the mind is like a parachute. It works best when it's wide open. And what I'm going to challenge you today is to keep your mind wide open. And I guarantee you, if you keep your mind open, you will get a valuable nugget of wisdom that you can apply to your life so you can take reach your next level of greatness. I've been looking forward to my conversation with my special guest today. We actually spoke at a football coaching clinic a few months back and you know we just connected over social media and you know we just you know having some great conversation so i thought it'd be a great opportunity just to bring him into the huddle today and and learn more about him and and his journey my guest in the huddle today is ken Iver. how are you today ken i'm good now jt i've been playing with button shares i got myself set up and now uh i'm not sure if you see me I don't. You, I all I see is your your name and bright, bright <laughs> white lettering. Okay, let me see now if I can. <laughs> I don't want to leave the meeting. I think I touched the flux capacitor. Okay, and that's never a good thing. So let me see if I can get this up. Give me, okay. but, but at least you can hear me. That's a good thing. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, and I'll get this video up here. Uh, you know, folks, I, I think that this is a great reminder. You said, you said it was organic, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the beauty of life, right? Show show all the fun parts. Okay. So da, 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 da. I'm unmuted. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to leave. I don't want to leave the meeting. Okay. Just tell me I'll leave the meeting. So if I if I leave the meeting briefly, it's because I'll, I'll rejoin it right away. Okay. <laughs> well, but, for, well yes. while I do that, though, yeah. because um, you asked me a couple of questions before we start yeah. get started. And so yeah. I, want to ask, I want you to think about the value uh, that we're bringing to the world. You okay. being a Western guy yeah, and me being a Laurier guy yeah, and how this is a pioneering moment <laughs> in so many ways. Yeah. I, okay. I, I, I hear you. So, so I'm going I'm, I'm to leave the meeting. I'm going to come right back to you. Okay. Okay. So folks, again, great, just a great reminder as Ken comes back on, you know, there's, this is where, this is why I wanted to do the huddle this way, was I wanted to show all the fun parts of life, that really the beauty of life is in these organic moments, where, you know, things don't always go as planned, but you have fun with it, and you roll with it. And we're back. This was our Apollo 13 moment. Exactly. So great, great practice for me to always, you know, practice, right? To preach what I, what I consistently practice. So, so Ken, I'm curious, you know, one of the things I always like to do in the huddle is to take a moment uh, to, to send some gratitude. I know today was a special day for you. You had a, a supply yeah. teaching gig. So, you know, brother, I just really want to take a moment just to send you some gratitude for finding some time for us today. And, you know, especially after a long teaching day, I know what those feel like. <laughs> yeah, it was a good day as my, my debut. And, and uh, uh, when you're a supply teacher, you're the new kid on the block. Yeah. And I think because all the kids were in Halloween costumes, I dressed up as a Fortnite character. Uh, I earned some street cred with them. Oh, and I so like it, it wasn't as challenging. Plus we watched a bunch of Halloween videos through the day anyways, barely got any okay. work done. So I don't think it was a true uh experience in terms of the teacher student experience and being the new guy in the block uh next time might probably be a little different but uh okay. still appreciative and it was a lot of fun and 
And, uh, you know, it was just a great day. And uh, the funny thing is, you talk about, sometimes we talk about connections. Yeah. Uh, the teacher who brought me in, uh, her dad is Jim Foley. Okay. And he was an Ottawa Rough Rider, great cup champion, back on that with Tony Gabriel team in 76. Number nine, okay. Jim Foley was known for wearing black shoes. So she's a daughter of football and and thought it'd be good to have me come in. And so, so I, had, I think the highlight was just playing catch with the football during the recess. So it was good. Yeah, it was a good day. Ah, I got paid to do that. That's pretty good. I know. It's a pretty sweet gig, eh? <laughs> probably, and I probably got paid more than what I got when I was in the CFL. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> definitely going to dive a little more into your story. So one of the things I like to do in the huddle, Ken, is I like to remind people that life is a game and games are supposed to be fun. So I'm curious, what is an interesting fact? Some may say a quirk that you have that maybe a lot of people don't know that you would be open to sharing with our community. Um, I think when you see someone who's been successful in athletics and someone who's been successful in some, some chapters of their life, you automatically assume that they're uber talented and it just kind of came to them. And the truth of the matter is, is that in terms of my skill versus hard work ratio, uh, the ratio leans heavily towards my hard work, being a hard worker. Uh, I never thought I was talented. And because of that, it probably opened up the, the mere possibility uh, uh, of me becoming a hard worker, a student of the game, be it in athletics or whatever I'm doing. I've always been a big, big advocate of, of learning. And it probably has a lot to do with when I got drafted by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders back in the day, and I was drafted ninth overall. And I went up on stage and I was a two-time All-Canadian receiver and all kinds of awards at Laurier. I went up on stage and I said, welcome to Saskatchewan. You're a free safety. <laughs> And my ego could have said, what? But because I love the game of football uh, and I got to training camp, they taught me everything about defenses that I need to know because I didn't know any of that stuff in college. The quarterback would look at me in college and say, Ken, what do you got? What, what do you kind of panic? Mm, I'll run a corner route, score a touchdown or make a big play. It was kind of easy. I just out athlete guys. When you get to the pros now, you can't do that. And I learned that there's great value in working hard and becoming competent. And the number one rule, if you're a receiver in, in pro sports is never leave your quarterback guessing. And I took great pride in never letting my quarterbacks, leaving them guessing where I was going to go. Damon Allen would say, you have a 13 yard, 14 yard hook route. It was always that depth. Get to that spot on the, on the field. Don't leave him guessing because if you do, you're not going to be playing much. You won't be on the field all that often. And so hard work and really becoming a student and, and, and honing my craft. It's the four stages of learning, really, right? You don't know what you don't know, and you realize you don't know something, so you better start learning. And then you realize there's great value in learning, and then there's great value in taking that learning to the next level and becoming an expert. And and I think I think we're subconsciously I think we're always on that because we're always having to grow, always wanting to evolve. And it's really that simple that process. And that's that's the big thing. I I didn't have a lot of talent relative to other athletes who went to the bigger schools, I was a guy who worked hard. So it sounds like your ability to really have that open mind, right? The mm -hmm. ability to be coachable, to, yeah. to always be learning, which is, is why I feel that athletes make transition well to so many other areas of life, because they have some of those intrinsic life lessons that we just learned, right? Being on the field or on the ice or whatever your sport is. So I'm curious, was that lesson of, of always learning, always being coachable, always yeah. being open-minded, was that something that you naturally got or is that something that you just learned along your journey? I learned it along the journey as, as there's more talented athletes around me. And I realized that I wasn't as talented. I wasn't as fast. I wasn't as big. But I also realized that the talented athletes had all this great skill and potential, but they never really understood the game they there was all speed or they all there are one or two trick ponies whereas when you really know the board you're seeing the board right you're, you can be two steps ahead you're watching body language the will linebacker there's a free safety and then you, you take the information from watching film and, and 
and and and say, okay, oh, that linebacker might be blitzing. Watch out for this halfback blitz. All those little things you see pre-snap. It's almost like you become a really good poker player. But to become a really good poker player, you can't just not know the math. You can't watch your opponents because there's information they're relaying. They may not think they're relaying it, but there's information coming from them that's going to be awfully valuable. Now, the three times I got knocked out in the CFL, all were connected to moments where I misread the information that was being shared. And, and so, uh, and, and the funny thing is, is when I left football, when I finally retired, uh, I didn't transition as well. Uh, leaving football. I didn't say, I didn't wake up and say, Oh, I got all these skills from football. It's going to translate into another career. What I did was I sat down with a piece of paper and pen and okay, let's build my resume. Okay. And so well, if there's a company that needs a guy to catch a ball on second down and 10 in the red zone late in the game, well, I'm your guy. But Microsoft and, and all those companies that were out there, they're not looking for that guy. They're looking for the person who just who's graduated nine years earlier with their degree and, and are going right into going right into their job. So I spent nine years, loved playing football, had a great time, no regrets, but it kept me away from a real job. And, uh, I was, I was blessed in that, uh, I ended up going into the broadcast business television and covering the Ottawa senators, and the 67s, the, the renegades and doing all that stuff. But it was, it, that was all still in my realm from sports. It was all definitely connected to it. So when I left broadcasting, it was really tough. And I went back to football. I played nine years. I probably should quit after seven, but because I didn't know the devil I was dancing with outside of football, beyond football, life beyond football. Uh, I didn't know the devil. So I chose the dance with the devil I knew. And that was to stay in football, even though I had knee surgeries, even though I was taking anti inflams and painkillers and all that stuff. And what for $55,000 before taxes, all because you know, driven by fear. I hated football by then. I didn't want to play suit didn't fit me, but, uh, Versus going into Canada Post and interviewing for a job and feeling like a complete buffoon and, and, and feeling like I'm setting myself up to fail. A part of me wishes I could, could have played football till, till I hit 60. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, yeah, life is about chapters. And as you said, there's, there's moments, right? And you got to mm -hmm. try to seize the moment. And saying seize the moment, very good cliche you see on link, LinkedIn and Instagram and stuff. Easy to say. Yeah. Hard to do. Hard mm -hmm. to do. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, again, I, I can definitely appreciate, you know, everything you're describing, Ken. You know, I, I think of my own transition away from teaching and coaching. It was the first time I, you know, um, was away from any sort of sport, the game for probably close yeah. to 25 years. So I remember it was, like you said, it wasn't easy. You know, it, it was. So, so I'm curious. What was, was there a moment where you kind of realized that, I don't know, maybe you had some clarity on, you know, like what's the next adventure? Was there this moment where it's kind of like that proverbial wake up call where you thought, okay, yeah. like, we need to. I think, I, I think a lot for me, and, 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 you know, you talk about gratitude, uh, gratitude extends from being given a gift. You're thankful for the gift. And, uh, you know, to be quite frank, I went through a really tough time leaving football. And uh, I had promised myself that I would take a year off to get away from it, just to get away. And think about football beyond it. I had, I had wanted to go to Europe and play and coach, but I blew my knee out, so I couldn't do that anymore. So that plan went awry. I had taken a computer programming course because everybody was taking computer programming at the time. So I went to CDI College and spent 17000 on a, on a computer programming course that Again, didn't fit, but everybody else was doing it, right? So I decided to do what everybody else was doing. And I think the, the clarity for me was uh, when I went in to get, to get there were two of them. One, I went in to uh, did a, an audition for the sports gig with A Channel, CHRO, and URO back in the day. And I didn't think I did very well. And I said, okay, so what do you do? And I said, I, I made an appointment with the sales manager. I said, I'm not going to be on TV, but I'll get in on sales. I don't know how to sell, but how hard could it be? 
I got a name in the community. I played pro football. It get me in the door. So I made an appointment with the sales manager, John Middleton. And uh, as I'm waiting for my interview with him, the station manager comes in, the guy who had hosted my, my audition. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I know I, I tanked it pretty bad. And so I'm, I'm going to meet with John. I'm going to get on the sales team. And that would be my way, right? Same destination, but a different path. Mm-hmm. That's all. And he said, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't great, but it wasn't that bad. And, and he said, he said, we'll start you off part-time. And part-time, when you hear part-time, most people say, okay, 20 hours. My part-time was oh, the same way I approached a Saskatchewan training camp. My 20 hours is actually 60 hours, mm-hmm. right? Until they said, well, okay, we have to pay you full-time because you're taking, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. So, okay, full-time is good. Full-time hourly wage is good. And then I still kept putting my 60 in. And, and then they said, okay, we have to offer you a contract, a full-time contract with all the benefits and everything else that comes with it. And uh, I would just, I decided to outwork everybody. Now, the funny thing is, uh, when my son, Elijah, my firstborn, was about to arrive, it's the last ultrasound we were going to have before he was going to arrive. We, got a, we all got a text at work at the TV station, come meet at the station in the studio. So I walked in and got into the studio, and I was like, are you in the studio or are you in the gallery? I said, it's a uh, studio. I read the email. I, just, I thought everybody was just a staff meeting, meeting in the, right, in the studio. And uh, turned out those who were in the studio were being let go. And those in the gallery, and you can see them right through this glass partition. You can see the other people. It's like Survivor Island. They survive, and we're all getting canned. And they gave me the brown envelope, the compensation, and all that in the package. And uh, it was good. And it, it allowed me to be home with my son. I was, I'm an older dad, so I want to be home with my son. But it also, I used the birth of my son as an excuse because I was scared, I was scared shitless about life now. Because now I had a son. Now I had some real responsibility, right? And it couldn't be about my ego. And it was really tough. And uh, to sort of get, again, redefine yourself, to seize the moment, to do all those things. Easy to say, hard to do. And then when you throw my ego into it and you throw the fact that I played pro football and you throw the fact that I was in TV, okay, I'm not going to be working at Foot Locker. I don't need people come out to me at Foot Locker, right? All that stuff, the shame attached to and it was, it was really tough. It was really tough. And, and the funny thing is, is every time I've decided to just take a position of being authentic, being true to myself, teaching, helping out with kids, coaching football, doing some things that I'm doing, it's all kind of manifested and worked out. And so I just got to sort of trust when you take that leap of faith, trust that you can hit some water. Well, and, and, and I appreciate you being so honest and vulnerable no, with no us, Ken. And, you know, what I really heard from you was this idea of, I love that you sort of uh, shared at the end that, you know, when you sort of move in the direction of doing what you love, as cliche Mm -hmm. as that is, right? And and there's just this energy and enthusiasm and passion, right? That you bring, you bring to the table, right? That is just people, I don't know, people buy that, right? Like, I'm a firm believer, people can feel whether you're authentic or not. So I guess... The question I have for you is, again, you work with people, right? You're an expert in leadership, in in team, in in culture. So so my question to you is, from your experience working with people, Mm -hmm. why why do you think so many people struggle when taking on a new adventure, right? Like what, you know, what, what is it that causes so much of us to go to these uncomfortable places. And again, I, I'm saying that as someone who has yeah. experienced in the last two years. I think what happens is a lot of people think not them. Not them. Tony Robbins, yeah. Brene Brown, JT, Ken, whoever. People they see are successful and they're doing what they think are unique things. And they don't realize that we see people doing these things that, that they think aren't unique, that are really cool and special. But you get caught up in that, oh, it, it, it wouldn't be me. It's not me. That's not who I am. I'll, I'll never be that. And and that kind of thinking, and it reminds me of, I remember in grade two or grade three, and the teacher would get, get you in the class. Okay, settle down, class. And okay, ask you a question. Um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the hit kids' arms shoot up, right, like lightning. And 
NBA player, an NHL player. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a veterinarian. I want to be a lawyer, all that stuff. But it's a trick question because we're all going to do something. We're going to do lawyer, veterinarian, all that kind of stuff. But who, who, do, you want, who do you want to be? That's a little more nuanced. It's probably splitting hairs. But who do you want to be when you get to that? become a veterinarian, a doctor, right? Because there's a lot of people who are doing things that you look at from the outside in and say, wow, successful, and they're unhappy. And you see a lot of people who, you know, they get to a certain stage and they say, you know what? I'm changing paths. I'm, cha I'm, I'm, I'm tacking the ship the other way. And a lot of people look at them and say, wow, that's courage. Mm -hmm. And and that's the, that's the sad part is that it's courageous to do the best thing for you. When in fact, it should be kind of easy, but we get in the habit of doing something we don't want to do and believing that everybody else is special. Yeah. Okay. Now do you want to be a Grammy singer, but you can't sing. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it won't work out, but there's other things you can do that, that will connect to that same passion and that same, that gives you that energy. Cause it's, it's kind of funny when you decide to take that leap, you made that leap when you left teaching, mm -hmm. there's that, Oh crap moment. What have I done? <laughs> Yeah, but but then you say, I don't want to live my life looking in that rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. I got to look forward, and, uh, and and that's part of the it's part of the appeal. It's part of the fear, but it wakes you up. Mm -hmm. It wakes you up, right? And uh, I think that, that I think that's a big part of it. And we get caught up in, okay, we have to have a certain SUV. We have to have a certain house. We have to have a certain status, a certain job. And so we can retire when we're 55. And you're seeing more people now saying, I'm going to live while I work. I'm not going to wait, wait till I'm 60. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends. And there's nothing wrong with working in the government. I have a lot of friends who love it. But I have some friends who say the, the most appealing thing about working in the government are the benefits. And I know they're unhealthy physically, mentally, spiritually, mm -hmm. all that. So they're going to need the benefits versus the person who's going to say, oh, I'm going to hop in the trapeze with no net. Let's see where that takes me, right? They don't hang up. They don't all of a sudden take off going, well, at least I'm going to do it because I have benefits. I mm -hmm. want to go because I want to fly. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, brother, I, again, I, I love what you're sharing. The one thing that jumped out to me is you, you know, you talk about B and, and I, I'm a firm believer that that is the powerful place. Like, who do you want to be, right? Like what, what values do you want to embody? Right. And so I love that you're going there and that, right. That's that spiritual connection. And it's interesting that, you know, as you were sharing, I thought of my own journey. And I remember when I first started on this personal growth and self-development, my own personal journey, I remember listening and or listening to podcasts, reading books and thinking, oh, they're so lucky, right? They must have some special gift. And I remember it just kind of made me used to feel really crappy, right? It was just like, woe is me. And, you know, now what I've come to realize is when you see people doing great things, they're just showing you what's possible when you go all in, when you, like you said, when you fully commit and, and, and you know, drive the ship in the other way. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious, you've worked with people that have made these pivots. Yeah. Do you notice a theme between like people yeah. when they kind of decide like, okay, yeah. time to alter course, time for this new adventure, new path. Like, is there something that happens? Yes, there's two things that happen, two possibilities. Okay. And it, it connects me to a book by, I think it's William Bridges. It's about transitions. Okay. So that's what you're doing. You're transitioning. But what happens is people say, I want to, I want to transition and I want to change. I want to pivot, but I still want to carry all that luggage I have just in case it fails. Right. So now you're carrying this luggage and you're trying to fly. It's like trying to fly with a fridge on your back. And I was struck by this book by William Bridges because it, essentially for you to go on to something, a new chapter that's alive, that's going to bring you life. You go, you're probably going to have to let something die. And maybe it's the fear of what people will think. Maybe, maybe it's your dad was an accountant, your grandfather's accountant, your great grandfather's accountant, but you want to be a voiceover coach or whatever it's going to be. Somewhere along the way, you have to let it go. Some of those expectations that you put on yourself 
and realize that if if you're worried about people thinking about you here's the god's honest truth they don't care i quit the ottawa sooners in grade 12 they went to the national championship we lost and they won the championship the next year and i said you know what i played one year as a youngest guy on the team and I, it just didn't fit but i wasn't a great student so i moved to toronto for grade 13 leap of faith got on a bus at midnight with a bag full of clothes and lived with my sister young in eglinton and i love this i love sharing the story i often forget about it but uh serendipitous moments i got off the bus and i went up I had to register for grade 13 or high school. And just up the road on Roehampton in Toronto, Roehampton Drive is North Toronto Collegiate, grade school. Dave Sapun just went there, right? Western guy. But I couldn't find their football coach. So I walked the other five blocks the other way where Northern Secondary was, their arch rival. And I walk in and this silver haired coach with these cool sunglasses walking down with a rugby shirt on. And he sees me, he's like, hey babe, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'm going to, I'm thinking of registering, but I just want to see if the football coach is here. So I'm the football coach. There's Clark Pulford. His brother is Bob Pulford, who played for the Leafs and, and just a great man and rest, rest in peace, a great soul. And I said, uh, well, I, I play some football. I said, where'd you play? I said, well, I played in Ottawa. He says, which high school? I said, no, I just finished playing junior against 21, 22 year old guys. We went to the national championship. We lost, but I was a starter and all this stuff because I think you're going to make the team. <laughs> <laughs> right you're gonna make the team and and so i had i had about i guess three or four days before going to training camp the week before school started so i walked all the way down young street in toronto and i saw you see people with green hair and all kinds of characters walking down young street now in ottawa if you walk down banks you see someone with green, green hair back then or if someone was in high school with green hair and they go to their 25th reunion they say hey there's that guy there's that girl that had the green hair remember that defined by that moment mm -hmm. i walked down young street and you can see four people green hair and nobody blinks right and you stop worrying about what people are looking at because the truth of the matter they're not looking at you they yeah. don't care they're living their life right mm -hmm. and the world is so big that if if you're if you're not doing what you want to do if you're not changing course you're not doing all those things the world doesn't care the world doesn't care. And, 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 and people, the people who they've judged you negatively, be, oh, how can you do that? It's because one, they would never do it. They haven't got the courage to do it. And two, uh, they don't understand that yearning, that, that need to, to change paths. And it led me to university. It led me to the pros. It led me to everything that's ever happened since then. By like getting on that bus at midnight, downtown Ottawa, and getting to Toronto and starting over. And I, and I love that story. And, and again, you got a beautiful way of just like, I feel like I'm walking down Young Street with you and just my mom's actually, side note, my mom used to have her office down there. So interesting. So you, know, I right? yeah. you know, right? Yeah. And, and it's interesting that, you know, it, it's, it's funny how we are so conditioned to care what other people think. Right. To like, like, you know, when, when, when this judgment that we hear that we so absorb from our environment is so strong that it literally paralyzes, it, it, it like figuratively paralyzes us from making decisions of things we actually want to do. So, I know, but, the, but the irony there is that we get older and we wish we could sing like Lady Gaga. We wish we could be Thor. We wish we could be all these things when we could have been, but we, we sold it. We, we, we sold the farm. We gave up that right when we start becoming what we thought people want us to be. We start wearing the same clothes as everybody else. We start listening to the same music. We start doing all those things. You know, uh, going into high school, grade, grade nine back then, now, now I guess it's grade seven, but the pressure of you're trying to figure out your way as a young person and, 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 you have these feelings and these thoughts and these ideas and dreams and all that stuff. And you get to school and, you know, all of a sudden you can't trust people with those, those dreams. You want to put them somewhere safe and protect them versus finding your lane and going for it. Right. Because then you go, then you go, then you go to the school reunion 25 years later, right? 
oh my God, I never would have thought you're a surgeon. You went to UCLA, you went to Stanford, you did, all, you know, you were an actor, you did all these things. And uh, yeah, one of the really cool things about Toronto, my best friend was a guy, his name is Mark Pauly. He was an actor and his mom was a casting agent. So she sent me to auditions. I didn't know to act. I'm about stiff as a two by four trying to act. But these were experiences. And his little sister is Sarah Pauly. And Sarah's gone on to become a great actress and all that, right? And the great thing about Northern Secondary is Megan Fellows was there and she was uh, Anna Green Gables. So there's actors and all kinds of different people that I would never have experienced here in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. and, and when you see that and you say, the clouds didn't open up and they were just born special. They honed their craft. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, I don't know. I, I, so many great moments. I've been, I'm, again, I'm grateful. Yeah. And, and uh, looking back, so many great people. Well, and, and you bring up a great point. And, you know, as you're sharing there, you know, one thing I've really observed from you and, and really felt from you as we've been talking here is just mm -hmm. your ability to like pivot, to innovate, to adapt, right? To be able to read a defense, right? If we're giving a football analogy and find the, the you know, how you can, you know, find a lane, right? Whatever you want to use that analogy. And, it's interesting that really what it comes back to is it comes back to that simple idea of your willingness to take risks. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and no, don't, don't even call them risks because mm -hmm. as soon as you call it a risk and you label it, mm -hmm. now you're on the cliff, right? Mm -hmm. Looking down into the, mm -hmm. the depths. Mm -hmm. Don't even call it a risk, a passion, yeah, a calling, mm -hmm. right? Whatever it is, but to call it a risk means, you know, you can lose something in this. And right. the truth of the matter, the irony is that if you don't pursue it, you're definitely going to lose something. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I love that reminder. It takes me back to that, you know, that Nelson Mandela quote, which is one of my favorite. Like, what if you treated every moment simply as an opportunity to, that you're going to win or you're going to learn mm -hmm. something? Right. Yeah. And it sort of takes the pressure off and you're objective with yourself. And yeah. you just, it just, it's, I find it's just an easier, it's a, it just feels better to live that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, sure. And, and you don't get caught up in, in what other people are doing and, 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 and judging yourself being your own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I should have done more. I wish I'd done that. I could have done this and all that stuff. If, if you got a moment today, then take advantage of that moment. That's your growth opportunity. You can't go back in time. You can't click your heels with red shoes on and go back in time. You can't get in a DeLorean and go 85 miles an hour and go back in time like Marty McFly. So let that go and grab the moment you have. And, and here's the cool thing for me. And I didn't want to get into it. You mentioned I was teaching today. And I didn't get a chance. To, I thought I was going in to teach a class, help teach a class. But it's actually, I, I end up one-on-one -on -one with a special needs boy grade five and just a wonderful boy and i was so apprehensive i was thinking of tapping out at about 35 40 minutes because i'm like oh my god what did i get myself into and i said no because i remember when i was at the Ottawa boys and girls club and when i went to grade one and grade six at centennial public school there were three parts of the school there was where all the student body was there was another area that was specializing with kids with hearing impaired there's another area specialized with children who had physical disabilities but we were all they're interwoven in terms of the student body. And it was such a great, you don't realize it when you're that age, but such a great opportunity because you're, you're hanging out with some really cool kids and you're not judging them because they're in a wheelchair. You're not judging them. In fact, the guys who are hearing impaired, Larry and Regent, I'll never forget because uh, they were the most competitive son of a guns I've ever met in my life. So we play floor hockey and stuff and they'd curse like sailors. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, then you, and, 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 uh, just great people. And so in that moment today, I said, this is one of those moments. It takes me back in time, it connects me to my roots. And uh, I had to develop some, some trust with him, some credit with him. Mm -hmm. And then by the, just after, just near the middle of lunch, found a football in the playground and started playing catch. And he was laughing and running and catching and having a great old time. And, uh, you know, who knows, you know, he's, he's, he's a young boy who's on the spectrum. I'm not sure if he'll remember it, uh, but it's funny when you give, 
what you get back. And it's not what I expected today, but I'm glad I stuck around. I'm glad I didn't look down at off the edge of the cliff, looking down, thinking, oh, this is kind of a risk. I don't want to do this. What if I really mess up? Right. I decided to reverse tech and go the opposite way and say, this is a great opportunity to have some fun. So, yeah. And, well, he, was dressed I, up as, and he was dressed up as a ninja to the best ninja ever. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. So brother, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Yeah. Thank you. So I have one last question for you. Go ahead. Sure. One thing that I like to remind people is that challenges, setbacks, obstacles are part mm-hmm. of the game of life. Oh. It's not that we want to expect them, but we just understand they will pop up from time to time. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, what is a piece of advice, maybe a suggestion you would offer to maybe someone who's going through a challenging time right now, you know, one focused action they could take today so that they can get back on their feet, create some positive momentum and get back on their journey to greatness. That's, that's a good question. I think, you know, oftentimes when the eye of the storm, the mountain looks really big. Right, you, you see photos, you video of the great mountains in the world, and Mount Everest, and, all, and when, especially when it's all cloudy around it, and you see the top, you go, man, it reaches the heavens. Right, there's no way I can climb that mountain. No way I can get past this moment. It's just too too big. And as you climb a little bit, and now it doesn't look that bad, and you're honing your mountain climbing skills. Then you get a little higher, but your confidence now is growing. And then once you climb that mountain, next thing you want to do is climb another mountain. And it's habit forming. And I think uh, tough times can last long if you let them stick around. Right? And, and, it, and sometimes it's going to ask you to find solutions that you've never found before, you've never used before. And it's, it's going to mean you have to get creative and, and trust your intuition and believe in yourself. Intuition is such a big part of it, right? Um, just listen to what your, your mind and your heart's telling you, right? And, and that in that moment, it doesn't define your worth. It really doesn't. Because the fact of the matter, I tell my kids this all the time, and I tell kids this all the time. And the moment we're born, we're already special. We're already great. We're already awesome. Because we're so unique right from the get-go so don't think you're not great already don't think you're not special and and capable yeah you may have to ask yourself the question do i really want to do this or am i doing this because everybody else is doing and 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 that's part of it and and yeah trust your intuition that's that's so big for me uh i'm probably in Again, I'm 56. I have a 10 year old, an 11 year old, and a 12 year old. I'm a young dad. Oh, there goes the fire trucks coming by me. I'm parked by Vincent Massey because I was stuck in traffic. So I apologize for the background. Oh, it's all, it's all good. You said, you said this was organic, but there goes yeah. the fire trucks. <laughs> I, uh, I just, I'm a big, big proponent of people trusting their voice, believing in their voice. And knowing that there, there's value attached to what you're, you're thinking and feeling. And, and, and finally, no one's perfect. You're not perfect. You're not perfect. We're perfectly imperfect. Yeah. And you come to terms with that, you're going to be okay. I think you're going to be okay. I hope you're going to yeah. be okay. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I love it. Keep it simple, simple. <laughs> That's it. Keep it simple. And, um, it's funny, I, when I could run, my knees feel bad now and I try to run, but when I, I'd always run and I'd, I'd get my, my belt on with my Advil and my four water packs, right? And all this stuff. And, and uh, I'd have my iPod on my arm, my headphones, right? And uh, if something went wrong, it was an all or nothing affair. I'm not sure if you've ever been there. So if the water, I drank all my water too fast or, the Advil wasn't kicking in. My knee was still sore. I, I was tight. I didn't stretch enough. Uh, maybe my iPod died. And uh, I just started to run naked in that no water. 
I took a couple of Advil because I knew my knee was going to be sore, but no water. I didn't need music. I didn't need Rick James. I like to party all the time. Or uh, I didn't need, right? I didn't need Starship. Right? <laughs> I didn't need any of that stuff. Just run and listen to your body and your mind. And, and if you listen to your body and your mind's telling you stuff, you say, okay, mind's saying stretch a little bit, slow down. You do that. And all of a sudden now the mind and the body starts to connect. And now your stride's a little longer. And now you've put in five kilometers, but you don't remember putting in the five because you're just in a place. You're not thinking about, oh my God, how far am I? I'm over here. I'm, I still got to get to there. What about traffic? Oh, my shoes are, my feet are sore. All the stuff that you worry about. And when you can put like four or five K and you don't even remember doing it because mm-hmm. right? you've, you've connected the dots. And that's pretty cool. And uh, I blew my, I, 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 I had a calf injury before I ran the Honolulu Marathon in 2004. Training in the cold, did a little calf thing, so it didn't bother me that much because it was cold. But now you get to Hawaii and you're running, it's warm. And about halfway in, JT, no word of a lie, it, it felt like a sniper got me. A calf just blew up. And it was the most emotional experience of my life, athletically. Because... Uh, the reason why I ran the marathon is because in football, you can have a good game and win, have a bad game and win, right? Uh, but when you get in there in the marathon by yourself, you got to get to the finish line. It's on you, right? Mm-hmm. And I blew up my calf. And I remember them saying, whatever you do, don't stop. Keep Just walk if you have to. Keep moving. So I walked and I cried and I prayed and I cried and I prayed. I thought of my sister, Joanne, who had passed away when I was four and she was five. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there was an energy in me. And it was a message was one step, one step, one more, one more. And that's all I did. It was that simple. You said to keep it simple, one step, one step. And the funny thing in Hawaii is that when you go, you go over a dormant volcano, diamond head, but it's pitch black when you're out there in the morning and start the race. But coming back, you can hear the finish line on the other side of the mountain, this, this, this volcano. So as I'm getting over the volcano, I can hear people, hey, Sven from Sweden, you're a marathoner, well done, right? All that stuff. And I had seen all that with the Iron Man and all that, right? So now all of a sudden, I got some get up in my go. They come over the hill and it's a long sprint. And, 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 if you have watched races and, you, and people say, well, why did that guy sprint at the end? He was crawling five kilometers or 10 kilometers ago. The reason why I'm sprinting is because I was crawling and I got beyond it. I got past it. Right. I listened to that voice and connected the dots. I ran naked. I ran naked in terms of I let it go. I, I cried. I prayed. I died. All those stuff. So when I went across the finish line. I felt pretty good. Yeah. Too many stories. I can go, uh, hey. I can go on. I can go on and on. I apologize. Oh, it's all good. I, you know, I love these stories, right? And that's what's about yeah. building the connection. So, Ken, I'm curious. How can we help? How can we support what you're growing right now? Is is there any way people can connect with you? Check out what you're up to. I know you're doing some speaking, coaching, yeah. all that stuff. What's the best? I, I, right now, I, I'm really focused on uh, Tectonic TLC Team Lead Coach. Mm-hmm. And tectonic as in tectonic shifts, right? Like the earth, like mother earth, we are all changing it. We're always in a constant state of flux and change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And really, I want to connect with people. I want to do team builds. I want to talk leadership. I want to talk coaching. I want to invest in the potential contribution that other people can make, mm-hmm. right? Isn't that the big thing to have a fan, to someone invest and say, hey, you can do that? Because I've had tons of coaches done that in the past and uh i was fortunate my dad played pro baseball pete rose and richie allen he was in the phillies in the red system and uh so athletics and 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 family was so important to us so that connection and investing in the other people around us because a lot of the kids in our neighborhood their parents were so busy and last story now stop boys and girls (laughs) club saturday afternoons four o'clock would close but the pool was still open from four till five for family swim so parents who worked on Saturdays had a chance to go take their kids swimming for a little bit. So my dad and mom would show up. My mom couldn't swim, but she'd just stay in the shallow end. And my dad would be doing cannonballs and being the class clown. But my dad would adopt Bing Hum and Nelson Lee, and Stevie Grabner and Mark Prevo and Roxanne and all our friends. 
because they were going to be going to an empty house or they were right. And they got an extra hour to go swimming. So the lifeguard would blow the whistle, do a head count say, okay, who are you with? Whose parents? And they're Mr. Rivera, Mr. Rivera. My dad had adopted mom adopted like nine, 10 kids. So they can stay there for that extra hour of swim. And he made invest in them. And then we'd all walk home together with our eyes burnt out because the chlorine was so high because everybody was pissing in the pool. Yeah. We had the rainbow. When you look at the, the street lamps and you see the rainbow because the chlorine was so bad in our eyes. Yeah. But it, it was just the way it should be. Yeah. It was just the way it should be. Oh, I love it, brother. And again, I love the I love all the stories. I love again, you're you're a beautiful storyteller, Ken. So uh, so I'm I, I'm looking forward to you know, stay connected and hear more of these. No, then, then if anything, JT, tell me, stop being scared about writing a book. Yeah. Hey, you tell know me what? to stop being scared because you're an author. Mm -hmm. And I am so, I have all these stories and all these things I want to put on paper as a tribute and an homage to my parents and my childhood and everything else, the people I've met. But I'm so scared because I think that nobody wants to hear the stories. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll continue this conversation, you and I, and, and I'll be happy to share. So, so Ken, I, I really want to take a moment to acknowledge you. I, I want to acknowledge you for the man you are, you know, uh, the great dad, the teacher, the coach, like just the great human, but most importantly, the great human being you are. Like the one thing I've really learned from even that first message you sent me, congratulating me on, on the new position of Football Ontario, whether it's just this, it's just like, you can tell you have such a love of people and, and just want to bring out the best in them. So I really want to acknowledge you for that and providing me for that important reminder. Listen, you know what? Um, anytime you can help a Western person out, yeah. because the Lord knows as soon as you go to Western, it's pretty well all downhill after that. <laughs> I got to do what I got to do, JT. I yeah. got a big heart. I got yeah. a big heart. I, I had to be there for you. Yeah, I hear you, brother. <laughs> now, my battery's at uh, 12%. Okay. And uh, a paramedic drove by, the cops are driving by, so they're probably wondering what the heck I'm doing. Yeah. So. Hey, mahalo. Take care. Okay. Much love. And uh, yeah. thank you for including me in the program. Yeah, we'll chat. We'll chat soon. Okay. So for all of you that are, have been listening, here is my challenge to you. Knowledge is potential power. Ken dropped so many valuable nuggets of wisdom that will help you succeed at the game of life. But it's the consistent and focused application of that great knowledge that's actually going to create the results that you want. So take one of these valuable nuggets of wisdom and go apply it to your life today so you can reach your next level of greatness. I look forward to chatting with you next time in the huddle. Have a great rest of your day.